Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 398, featuring an interview with Thomas Fenholm, the artist and designer of Thy Sword. Now, this is a, a little indie game. It's got uh, platformer elements with the RPG elements, kind of a hybrid game. And it really harkens back to the good old days of the uh, Commodore 64. And uh, maybe even a little bit of the, the Amiga era. Uh, so I know a lot of you guys will be interested in that. Uh, we also talk just about the indie scene, uh, why uh, Thomas likes uh, Steam so much. We talk about the indie apocalypse and uh, what it's like to make sprites. A lot of stuff in here about the, uh, the Commodore and the Amiga and all that good stuff. So anyway, a lot of great topics to cover here. So without further ado, here is Mr. Thomas Fenholm. Hello folks, I am here today with Thomas Finholm. He is the graphic artist and designer of Game Phase. Uh, the creators of a game I think you're going to be uh, really happy to see called Thy Sword. Uh, I've been playing it uh, pretty much all day, all morning. It's a, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of, uh, what I like about it is that combination of that retro feeling uh, platform game, but you don't have to deal with the emulation and you know, all, all of those hurdles and uh, I like this. It's got kind of a role-playing element in there, too. Uh, but anyway, uh, Thomas is a big fan of a Commodore. I guess he had the 64 and the Amiga back in the day. And uh, this game, to me, seems kind of like a... Would you call it sort of a love letter to, the, to that era? I would, yes. We uh, sort of joked around in the beginning there three years ago that uh, we kind of named a lot of classic games, and we, we all thought, well, that game was really great, but it missed that part maybe some RPG elements, and that game was a good role-playing game, but I'd like some more action, and, and we joked around, well, it wouldn't be great if you could combine all those elements and still keep it kind of casual, so in the end, after three years, I think we did a decent effort at it anyway. Yeah, I think you totally nailed it this time. Uh, I, I noticed, I just noticed before we started that you had done a, an earlier game uh, called Vindicator. Yeah, Vindicator Uprising, we re released that on Steam in 2015, so that was our first first proper game as a studio. So I guess you learned from that uh, <laughs> what to do, what not to do, what was that? How did you, uh, what did you learn from that experience that you were able to apply to Thy Sword? Well, uh, the, the, the long-lasting lesson, the first one, I guess, would be uh, that we realized, well, you obviously don't do a platform game as your first game, <laughs> and therein is a whole list of not to dos. But uh, we, why not we, do a platform game? What's what's the problem? Well, it, it of course depend on your uh, skill and background, but but the physics of jumping and all that stuff. So some say, okay, I recommend you do a kind of top D or a puzzle game, something that is easily with the mechanics and so forth. But uh, mm -hmm. we had we had kind of a story to it, and we and we said, well, let's go for it and make it really kind of try to make something special out of it. And then, of course, after that one, so, okay, let's what, what other genres can we do? Well, we got all these platform mechanics already in, and, and of course, the Conan, and uh, I guess we'll be diving into came, came around our heads then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people probably underestimate. They think, well, these games, platform games have been around for a long time. We had those back on the Commodore 64 and the Nintendo. They must be really easy to make. Uh, totally oblivious to all the physics and, like, having to set up those platforms. And, and this one, uh, Thy Sword, I don't know about Vindicator, uh, but Thy Sword, uh, this is all procedurally uh, generated levels to it, right? So that uh, that would be, <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to think about how that would all be programmed. I mean, it must have been quite a, quite a lot going on behind the scenes there to make that happen. Yeah, kind of like... Uh... We got a lot of inspiration from Spelunky and the area of, of indie games that hit big. So, uh, so it's procedurally generated, but kind of in the limit of one screen level. So, so Michael, our programmer, he uh, he, he wrestled with a few a few renderings of the of the level generated there. I think I think it was on the third third version that we were pleased with the results because you have to 
of course, calculate distance and you have to get through all the platforms without making too long a gap to jump. And, uh, and also you want to make it look kind of organic, not just a few levels and ladders in between. So it took a while to nail that. Yeah, if you didn't, if I didn't know that it was procedurally generated, I, I would, uh, I would have just thought that the levels were hand designed because it feels like that. You'll see the little, you're like, oh, I can see what he was thinking there. Make that just long enough to kind of, you know, jump over there, and then now you got to kind of bounce up and hit this. I mean, it feels very much like a, like somebody sat down and hand coded each one of those levels. So that, <laughs> that's really impressive. When I first heard procedurally generated, I was like, oh man, this is going to be. You know, chaotic, and there'll be levels that you can't get past because you know it's impossible and, and all that. So, <laughs> I guess in the play testing and the uh, that must have been the uh, the real crunch to get this game out, right? Yeah, it was. It's a challenging but but fun process, and of course you get a little best of both worlds. It's it's within a little smaller scope, so you have one screen to work with. But then when you play, uh, uh, you never play exactly the same level. Mm twice so that gives you kind of a replay value i think yeah i found that out i died it's like well i had it on the easy level it's been a while since i played these games so like i don't want i don't need the super hard mode or whatever uh, and then i thought well i think i kind of got this level figured out though so you know when i go back it'll be <laughs> whoop <Whoa! laughs> oh crap no it's all changed so uh, i like that you really do kind of have to figure out the level a little bit real quickly and I'll tell you something else I loved about it was the, the little crow or bird that comes or bat, I guess, with the key that comes out. You know, first couple times I saw that, he's just zooming. He's out of there before I even, you know, can figure out the level. <laughs> then towards the end, as soon as he pops down, I'm like, you know, jumping over all this stuff to get him. So I, I thought that added a lot, uh, a lot. To, it's one of those things, I guess, you wouldn't think that it would have that big a difference on the gameplay. Uh, but it makes... the <laughs> it's probably easier just to sh I'll show some gameplay footage so people can <laughs> see what I'm talking about. But this little key bird thing is, is a lot of fun. Uh, whose idea was that? Yeah, I, I think we, we had some some brainstorming sessions to try to come up with some uh, kind of puzzles for the levels. Uh, hacking and slashing is, is fun, but you want some to throw the player around a bit and, and make him pay attention to the whole screen. So, so we, we had uh, kind of a hard time at first, but then we kind of worked out, okay, what well, we got to work with here. Okay, there's loot, so we make a little mini puzzle how to get the loot. And we, I, I enjoy watching Twitch and Twitch and YouTube players uh, put up long curse word lists over that <laughs> word. <laughs> so that paid off just that one. Yeah, it's great because somebody like me, I'm kind of a methodical player for games like this. I want to just sit and stare at it for a while and make a plan and, and then jump into it. But then you got you realize if you do that you're going to miss the opportunity to get this key because it's only going to you know be on the screen for so long so you just have to say screw it you know I'm going in I'm going to... <laughs> right, <laughs> and it yeah. forces you into that sort of quicker response so that that was really nice so I understand Thomas that you took uh, three years uh, to make this game I mean that that's a uh, that's a pretty substantial time what was uh, what took the longest or what was the hardest uh, part of making the game. Yeah, I'd say I'd say that the three years that's not a that's not really full time because we we had jobs on the side. We've eased up a bit on that now, but especially in, in the beginning we all had full time jobs, so it was evenings and weekends, and then we kind of made more and more crunches and more often. So uh, really, really nailing because of course you get had the great greatest game idea in the world and you refined that but we really started with just our love for a setting and the old sword and sorcery fantasy world so we almost had the setting before the idea and then we just made a i think it was one weekend in the winter three years ago Mikael and i were sitting at my place and we we said well, okay we have to make this prototype now because we're we're always talking about it. So we made the little spinning <laughs> thing with that, and we said, okay, that's a game right there, just with that. <laughs> yeah, I was, I'm, one of my duties here at St. Cloud State, I'm the uh, faculty advisor for the Video Game Design Club. And so all these young people come in, and every every one of them, they have this this uh, big idea for a game, right? And they're, you know, they're, they're so guarded about it. Like, well, I can't tell you about my idea. 
And I'm always saying, look, the problem is not with the ideas, you know. <laughs> Everybody's got the ideas. What the, the, the problem is doing like you, you know, sitting down, making that prototype, getting that out, refining it, polishing it, play testing it. You know, <laughs> it's a, you, you know, it's it's so much work, right, to get the uh, from this this the idea phase, which is basically easy, <laughs> uh, to that. Here's the game. It's on Steam. Uh, check it out. <laughs> Yeah, it's the it's the last five percent that are the ninety five percent as you discover when you're closing in the final crunch. There, uh, I, I would say midway midway we had some problems. Maybe after a, a year and a half or so, we kind of uh, and of course you get a little home blind if you know what I mean. You after a while you have to kind of step back and zoom out and okay, what are, what are we doing here? So it was actually I think the last year when we started to. Uh, actually take away stuff and then the screen resolution changed up from here to there and then it actually got smaller and that helped the game and we removed the whole leveling up system that we had in place so that's and, uh, well, that must have been kind out. of bittersweet i guess taking out stuff that you'd worked on it was yeah it, it was a lesson learned along the way i suppose uh, it, it it was really couple of important milestones when we actually said that okay this is the core loop of the game that makes it fun and this part here may be not so important so if we strip that then it pushes kind of forward the the core mechanics yeah I remember when I think it was Brian Fargo I want to say it was him of Inter Interplay and he said I was talking to him about what it's like being a producer and he says that one of his big roles or his most important roles being able to go into a room and say you're done <laughs> not like you're fired, but, you know, we're not going to put in these new features that you're excited about. We, we just need to get the game. You know, it's good enough. <laughs> we need to ship this. Uh, I notice a lot of uh, a lot of guys, uh, they keep on, what's it called, feature creep? You, know, you just keep adding and, and adding, and, and <laughs> you don't give yourself enough. T I guess it's better not to have so many features and have them be really well-tested and polished and, and smooth, right, than uh, just to keep adding and adding and then end up with a mess right because you you get into that creative state and you it's it's really easy to keep adding stuff because you think well i'm having all great ideas here and uh, <laughs> yeah let's get into some of these these topics that you uh you suggested here uh, you mentioned this already there was some issues with the resolution uh, what, what what do you mean there is it too high it... well uh it, it kind of ties heavily into the graphical style because I, I started pixeling on the Commodore 64 and so I never got really into, you know, 3D rendering or any of that stuff. So I've always been kind of a low res preference guy. And uh, I, I sort of knew from the beginning that if we keep it, you know, true resolution, which means that everything is, is within the same resolution, no scaling up or anything, no rotating pixels. You see a pixel on the screen, and it's a, it's an actual pixel in, in Game Maker. So uh, I think that gives it the the sort of consistent look. It it helps out with the graphics because everything is is kind of have to be confined. It's not like hardware constrictions where everything is like eight by eight, but it gives it a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a pretty popular style these days. You know, I see a lot of games with that uh, with that look. Uh, I think we're well past the point. I used to worry about these games. Like, well, nobody's going to pay much attention to them. They'll, look, they'll say, oh, it looks too old-fashioned. You know, I just want to go back to my Call of Duty or whatever. Uh, but it seems like there's a building community of gamers that actually prefer this style. Yeah, I think it's it's several things, I'd say. Uh, of course, you can take any art style or game graphic style and, and, and find something that you like. But... Uh... I always compare it to kind of the basic set of Legos or something. It, it gives a, uh, especially in that size that we have in that sword, the, the characters are so small, but then when you animate them, it kind of, you have to kind of symbolically represent very much on the screen with a few pixels. And, uh, and if you do a decent job, I, I think people will uh, decipher that in a meaningful way. And I, and I always mention the, the fill in the gaps method, mm -hmm. kind of a, Compare it to when you read a book, you're, you're sitting there imagining all the stuff and, and, 
graphics are never as good as when you imagine your you know fantasy book or li literature or what have you so i think that also plays a part that what you don't see you maybe have to imagine and, and your brain kind of helps along yes yeah, one thing i've definitely noticed uh, doing all this work on uh, game history if you could look at these early games from the 80s if you just have a screenshots I mean, they could just look like crap. You're like, what is that? <laughs> it's just like a, just a bunch of blocks. Uh, but when they start the move, if you're actually playing it, it just kind of all works, right? And you, your imagination kicks in and fills in the blanks. And you can, it actually feels a lot more realistic uh, than it looks. Whereas with the modern games, yeah, you could have beautiful screenshots. Everything looks realistic. But it's almost like the opposite, right? Somehow it doesn't, you don't feel that same sort of, you know, the imagination doesn't kick in the same way. It's more like you're just looking, you're kind of looking at the graphics rather than it's like you're there with your imagination filling. The... <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say here, but you seem to, <laughs> maybe you could articulate this better than I can. I, I think we were, were on some on the same discussion at some point on Facebook with the Uncanny Valley. I think we commented on that. Uh, yeah, I, I, some someone needs to research this, but I think it's, uh, there, there's some signal in somewhere. Uh, of course, your preference and all that, but uh, I think I think sometimes it signals to your brain. Okay, this doesn't require you to to activate those areas and imagine and so on. This is already thought out, and mm -hmm. and some things uh, maybe spark that a bit more. And of course, text and lore in a game also does that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen the same thing in theater. Like when they teach theater classes, some of these productions, they won't have any props, or it'll just be some couple of guys and gals just kind of standing up there and they're pretending to hold a sword, let's say. And sometimes you can really get into that more than you can the more elaborate production. It's just really weird how that works. <laughs> you definitely, yeah, need, definitely need to do some heavy studies on this. I w I've always thought that uh, if you do it that way, well, there are no gaps or no badly drawn graphics if you do it at all in your. <laughs> Well, that's one of the things I wanted to get into, because uh, I, uh, I know somebody who I have sat down and tried to make some of my own sprites uh, for Game Maker. You know, sort of play it around. I quickly realized this is not easy. You know, you think, oh, it's just some pixels. Anybody can do that. No way. <laughs> you know, trying to get those pixels to look like something is a real challenge. Maybe even harder than working with uh, some kind of 3D modeling kit. You know, where a lot of that work is done. I mean, what what is? Do you have a technique or a how did you learn how to do this? Well, I had I had two primitive, uh, or for that time maybe advanced, but I had two pixels programs on the C64, and, and one was called Koala Paint. Oh, I remember that. And I never remember what the other one, I, I might find it online someday, I never remember the other one. That was a little bit uh, more sprite-friendly, I guess. Of course, you... you you didn't have a mouse for the 64, so you actually drew with the joystick and put the pixels there. <laughs> so that was a, a slow you And you're not still using that joystick, are you? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, on the Amiga, when you get the deluxe paint and the mouse, then it a whole other world oh, opens. Sure. And all yeah. those colors. But uh, I have to mention the, the shoot 'em up construction kit by oh, Sensible. Sure. That. When you really look back at it, for, for the Commodore 64, it was a really epic achievement in my my mind because to get a, a game running with just you could mod the sprite, of course, and then you could uh, draw your own. So you it was really a crash course in game making. Okay, you have three or four four colors, and okay, I need to show how the enemy waves would come down. Of course, they were only shoot 'em ups, yeah, but that a did show. a lot for me. I, that gave me kind of a window into, okay, you can make your own games. I'm sitting here with a, well, my parents called it a toy, obviously. <laughs> oh, who's laughing now that you're a millionaire? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I remember that uh, the, the shoot 'em up construction kits. There's a lot of games, uh, pretty fun games that I played just by people using that tool. Uh, I think there was one about Smurfs, like Smurf Hunt, you ever... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a Ninja Turtles one. one. I guess these were probably unauthorized uh, things, but you know that's what the kids would want to make, right? Uh, yeah, and I still think today it's quite a powerful tool to get into the kids' hands. Uh, I had, I had, I was fortunate. I had an older friend that always already was deep into it, so he kind of showed me the first steps, and I, I took it from there on my own later. But 
And I was amazed to find online that there are still communities and, and competitions even in, in Silk Games. <laughs> it's kind of a, one of the themes. I think it was, that, uh, I got a documentary, From Bedrooms to Billions, I think, is the name of that. And one of the themes I kept hearing was, uh, you know, back in the, back in the day, uh, the kids like you uh, could pick up the shoot 'em up construction kit and, you know, like make games, and that was cool. Uh, but it seems like as time went on, it got as it got more and more console based. You know, the kids are playing the games, but they're not ever they don't ever have that moment of hey, you know, I could do this. I could uh, make a Ninja Turtle game. <laughs> uh, I mean, do you think that's do uh, you think that's kind of coming back around now that we do have all this sort of indie scene and game maker tools and I mean, do you ever come across really young people uh, making games that are up on Steam? Yeah, well, with Game Maker and, and Unity, of course, it's it's accessible again. I think the the big wave a few years back, but uh, yeah, it's getting down in 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 the ages again. I think and and schools also, at least here in in Finland, it's been for a couple of years now a, a big thing to incorporate some of the, not necessarily programming, but the the thought process behind programming so that's in the math curriculum nowadays so it, a, a lot of factors play into that of course and it's uh, for somebody young in age just the creative side of okay here here we have some flash games and you can mod the sprites if you're into the art side then that's your entry and and uh, and i i discovered really early on that that programming wasn't really gonna happen for me i i tried the, the amos a bit for the amiga <laughs> later on but i had friends i had friends that made more progress in an hour than i made in six months so i okay i'll stick to art because i'm already started in that yeah i remember that amos <laughs> that's pretty you know i saw some pretty impressive stuff uh yeah but that's a great example so you just get in there you're tweaking the art and that inspires you to go to go on and to make something great right mm-hmm. uh I want to get in a little bit here. I know we got some other topics, but I'm kind of intrigued by this, by you know the the Finland aspect of this, and you know how that 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 scene is different than what uh, we might have here in, in the U.S. You know, is, is there sort of a distinctive character to that indie scene there in Finland? Well, of course, it's it's a small scene compared to some some places because it's uh, you know five million uh, population and so forth. So. So I think it's it's I always say it's it's an Alaska in miniature format, spaced out people really in wilderness in between and all that. But uh, of course there were some games that put Finland on the map. Not mentioning any names, but uh, <laughs> why not? <laughs> well, there's some birds here and there maybe. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's right. But, yeah. A, a strong I I would say. Uh, I was really a little bit too young on the Amiga, but there was a strong demo scene which was connected to the British and Germans and Polish scene. So I talked to those guys, some of them, and, uh, and some of them are still on it. Uh, it's in Helsinki. There's the big uh, assembly fair for demos and stuff. So a lot of it came from the demo scene, and of course tape trading and later discs and all that. It's, it's, I always wondered why the, well, we might as well jump into this. We've kind of been talking about the Commodore here and there. Uh, you know, I remember in the U.S., the, the Commodore 64 was hugely popular. Uh, but when the Amiga came out, there was a little bit of a splash there at the beginning, but then it just kind of got dwarfed by the uh, by the PC, <laughs> IBM compatibles, and it kind of fizzled out along with the, I don't, I never really even heard about Atari ST, I guess that was happening, uh, but it seems like in Europe, and maybe you can speak to Finland on this. Uh, for some reason, it really caught on there, in a lot bigger way. Uh, never quite understood why. Yeah, we always wonder because we learned uh, maybe a few years later. We we read about it being uh, maybe not as big in over in the states, and uh, I guess it's down to marketing and also distribution. But, but Poland and Germany and uh, of course Britain. And, and the Scandinavian countries, it was a really big, big nest for Amiga here. <laughs> I just remember as a kid, that was my, when I started to hear about that, uh, we keep getting these games for the Amiga, and all the new games were in German. 
And I'm like, I can't read this. I can't play this. You know, why are those? Why are all the smart people in Europe? <laughs> you know, here everybody's buying the, you know, into these other computers, and they're totally missing the the boat on this. You know, they're they're in, they're impressed with like CGA graphics. <laughs> it also got, this know. also could do, have a bit to do with you know uh, maybe advancement. The the 64 stuck around yeah. a long time here, and the Amiga got so many years. So we really Really, in the end, we tried to make it last, you know. So there were quite a lot of uh, people that got really efficient of using the computer. So that made it kind of a bigger scene also. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at even the games uh, that were like at the latter end of the Commodore 64's life, <laughs> I mean, they look like they'd be at home on a, uh, a Super Nintendo even, right? Uh, but yeah. if, you, if you do look at those early, like the Jump Man we were talking about earlier, <laughs> that looks really simple. Uh, compared to some of those later, you know, was it like the Turkins and, and all that? The reason, yeah, Turkin came out on the 64 too, right? Yeah. But anyway, you say that the C64 Amiga days is, is kind of a blessing and, and also baggage. And, you know, I guess there's some evils and some <laughs> positives. What, what do you mean by that? What What's the baggage and the blessing? Yeah, we, we knew going into both our first and our second game, we, we knew that we had a, a lot of a, kind of, a, I call it baggage, because we, we started a, on the 64, and it, it was really not until Amiga days, then we then we started to kind of make some small prototypes and uh, not complete games, maybe one or two that were actually run al standalone runnable games, but uh, we were really too young, I think 16, 17, just learning it, so we didn't... Uh, have time to catch on and, and actually do something before the Amiga fizzled out, as as you say. So so we had a lot of that still in our when we rediscovered you know game making and we we saw all this indie scene happening and we thought well this could be you know our second window mm -hmm. that we thought we'd never get. So so mm -hmm. we we said all right we we have a lot of dreams from the, those days that we obviously have to incorporate. We can't just sweep them under the carpet. That's never gonna work. <laughs> have to try to make it kind of a approach that will work for a modern audience and not just ride only the nostalgic side of it. Yeah, I see what you're saying there. You, you obviously you want to say, hey, if you guys were playing Pharaoh's Curse back in the day, I think you'd be interested in this new game. But on the other hand, the kids would be like, what? What the heck are you talking about? And so, yeah, it's kind of hard to hit both of those. But I was thinking that... I'd, you know, I'm thinking thy sword. I just, I'm just guessing here, but it's just the typical kid would see you playing that and want to come over and play. Uh, it just seems to be have a pretty universal appeal that that sort of game. Yeah, that that was one of our goals to try and make it appealing for all ages, and and I think we succeeded because uh, in in some uh, local kind of uh, games events and, and and that stuff we've been. Some some events abroad also, so we get uh, everything from you know five six, ages five to six that are there with their uh, parent or or old geezers like us, and they sit down and and it's a bit of a a few steps, and then you're into it. So then we make okay, the loop works. They're they're hooked, yeah. and then of course they get to the village and gamble away their loot. So, oh like, <laughs> yeah, man, what is up with that blackjack? What what do you call it? The, the horseman game, the four horsemen or something? Man, I lost every time I played that thing. Is it rigged? Come on. <laughs> the house almost always wins, uh, my friend. I think I think Michael found some old uh, some old histories about an an early version that became twenty one, and it it yeah, was kind of like this. I... yeah, I guess it was some European thing that it was called in a in a stage in time there, so. Of course, we put it before the shop, so then you can explore the gambling oh, site. Oh, you evil guy, yeah. Yeah, I went over, they had like maybe 20 coins or something. Uh, got past the gamble, like, well, I'm not going to play, waste my money on gambling. I get to the end, and then, oh, I could have a longbow or a sword, and that's a couple hundred. You know, I'll just run back to that gambler, and, you know, like this, I'll be re reeling in the money. Man! <laughs> it was a little I've been to a casino like twice and every time it was exactly that experience here's my money gone <laughs> and so maybe there's a lesson in this game for kids right don't don't gamble 
<laughs> yeah, somebody somebody was discussing it. I think it was on Twitch, and the the comments were saying, "Well, I guess the end boss is comes kind of a gambling intervention then, <laughs> or or the end boss or the end boss stage could be Las Vegas because they get really into the gambling. So I guess the most evil thing to do would, would be microtransaction actually taking part in the gambling. But that's <laughs> that's not us. That's so lucky you, lucky you players. Oh, what was that? Uh... Yeah, there's so many uh, really cool items uh, that you can buy off at that last guy. So you put him last, just hoping that people would waste their money gambling before they get. The <laughs> that's pretty. That's right. pretty cunning. Now let's. Oh, uh, one thing I was thinking about with this, I didn't really get to the co-op. I didn't have anybody to play it with, unfortunately, when I was playing it out. But I was thinking this game would be really uh, talking about crossing those generations. I, mean, I could really imagine a dad playing this with his kid. Or a mom with you know with her kid, and have you come across people doing that? Yeah, we we got uh, some, especially in the the late beta testing, we had some some really helpful friends that uh, that did the the co-op testing. So actually, a, an old older friend of ours that we met online, so he played it with his kids. I think they were uh, maybe fifteen and then eight, his son. So they. They'll, they'll be playing it along quite a, a while, I think. It'd, it'd be fun watching them play. I'm sure they have a lot of fun. And uh, at, one, at one local event, we had, I think it was a mother and her uh, and her daughter. She couldn't have been more than maybe seven or eight. And uh, and at some point, the, the daughter did the head chopping thing, and they both <laughs> died laughing, you know. <laughs> now, let's get into the story of Thy Sword. I like the poetry. And the, the bosses are really creative, I thought. I'm really satisfied after I killed that uh, dragon lord. <laughs> it took me about seven tries. I finally figured it out. Uh, but you say that you got to hear something about Conan or He-Man. Uh, I guess that's where you were. were. Those the inspirations, I guess, for the characters? Yeah, I, I think so. Those really classic. The first Conan movie really... Really, really stunned us as, as teenagers, I Arnold think. Arnold Schwarzenegger, yeah. Yeah, the original one. I, I hear he might be doing something with that role again, but I, I'm afraid to, to, to look up look it up online. <laughs> but uh, I think we'll, we'll also mention kind of a Man of War and the, the song where the name came from. So that's maybe if, if anyone in, is into music on that side, then oh, they'll Man pick up. Man of War, great band, yeah. Power of Thy Sword on their on their finest album, oh, in my wow, opinion. I didn't even think Triumph about that. So that's where the that's where the inspiration for the title came from. No, who did who did the music for the game? Because I, I love the music. Yeah, so so Mikael is the program, and, and actually his uh, twin brother Mats, who lives in a he's a teacher in Sweden. So we get together on holidays and, and uh, figure out the the key stuff, and then we work with him online also but he he's a music teacher and really we're all into wow, music he's a music speaking. teacher yeah so this is <laughs> that would explain why the music's so good and we all had uh, metal bands growing up i still do music on the side so so he did the orchestral title track and, and then we figured well Mikael and Mats had, had all the old hardware still and, and michael collects a lot of old hardware and keeps it in good shape so he actually busted out the old 64 with a SID chip and he made some kind of display for it to easily without a special monitor so he made a little display to and he uses something called the SID wizard if you're into SID chip I suggest you check it out the kind wizard. of a tracker music tracker for the 64 with a graphical interface so that's really great yeah check that out you said you're in a metal band what do you what do you play well I'm I'm a primarily the singer and uh, and I also play guitar and some other stuff. But I have I have one metal band and, and another band actually play in Irish traditional music. So it's kind of a big variety. <laughs> wow. Well, let's see. I guess we've covered quite a bit of stuff here. You do have another question here, or another topic, just indie apocalypse? Question mark. I indie apocalypse. <laughs> what what is this? Yeah, it, it took me some years before I actually started uh, researching what, what people were talking about. But uh, what, what I found out is basically the, the last few years, the, the market's uh, getting so flooded with indie games and uh, 
the kind of the threshold for publishing a game has gotten so low that people are com complaining about prices dropping and uh, the overflow of games and all that would lead to a sort of a crash in, in this system. Yes, yeah, sort of like yes. there was a video game crash of 82 or 83 when Purina Dog Chow had a game. You know? <laughs> You don't see that. You see that happening, or you think it's not going to happen? Well, uh, I think it depends on your your kind of uh, style and your your business and all that. But uh, like for somebody like us that do, do do it for kind of the art first and then try to make it approachable to people, mm -hmm. I think if you have if you have plans and you have uh, artistic visions that it's maybe not as big as a deal. There was a uh, big discussions on Steam when they uh, introduced their new system, and, and Greenlight went away, and now you have Steam Direct, and and anyone pays the quite low nominal fee, and you can publish your game. Yeah, I always thought that it's it's better just to have a ton and ton of crappy games because somewhere in the midst of that is going to be some really good games that could get made, and I think with Steam, at least I guess in theory. Somebody will find that good game and write a review of it and start getting some attention around it, right? And it'll, it'll rise to the top. Uh, but, you know, if, there, if there's somebody with a great game and there's no way to release it, except going through those big commercial publishers, you know, you just never would see any of this stuff, right? So maybe that's... Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. And, and, of course, maybe you, you can always think it this way. There are many games, but... If you make your game really the best you can, then maybe it has a chance of standing out. How do you feel, just as an indie indie developer, how do you feel about Steam? Is it sort of a love, hate, love or to hate it kind of thing? Or is it a... Well, I would say 90% love. At, at 90% love, wow. <laughs> that, that might be controversial high figure, but uh, <laughs> no, I think it's great. It's, it's like you said, the, the more the better, because competition makes you better. And uh, all that. So, did you put this? Is this also out on the <clears throat> for the uh, mobiles and iPhones and all that? No, we haven't done. We have uh, decided against the mobile wide version because there are so many controls that you need kind of an on screen thing, and those never re work out great. So, I think you really need the keyboard or a, a decent controller. Yeah, <laughs> I was planning it with the controller. I might try the keyboard. Yeah. I'm actually kind of thinking about maybe trying to hook up the old X arcade and uh, go go with the arcade style controls. I think it would be a good a good candidate for that. Actually, you have a preferred uh, controller? What do you play it with? Well, I I always played it mostly on the keyboard, so I I kind of got that hardwired into my my fingers where the button go. But uh, also played we tested all the controllers for different systems, so they all work. And and we had some some cheap knockoffs of the original uh, Nintendo controllers and they're you know a couple of bucks a piece so we're thinking of doing some custom giveaway and all that stuff oh that'd be sweet yeah i thought about that uh i was i got the, uh, the xbox 360 controller uh, which i think i would probably rather have that nintendo knockoff thing that might be fun <laughs> I, i'd be coming one your way <laughs> I, I, I thought about sending some local some local brewed delicious oh, uh, beverages, but uh, with the time difference and jet lag, I don't think they'll they'll be in rough shape when they get to you. So yeah. this might be a better thing. <laughs> well, is there anything else, Thomas, you wanted to say? Or, you know, obviously people go check out the game. It's on Steam. I didn't. What's what's the price on it right now? I didn't even check that. I would say it's a it's a kind of moderate price it's 8.99 full price and we did the uh, the launch sale and also the the christmas winter sale is coming up so check it out at your own own pace and so it's 8.99 on steam and you should just go buy it support guys like thomas <laughs> yeah go, go <laughs> check it out and fight. Fulfill your best the... everybody's <laughs> always asking me you know hey matt you play a lot of games so should i buy this or should i wait for it to go on uh, Steam sale. <laughs> yeah, should you wait for the sale? Or, or what is it, the indie? What is that little package, indie bu humble bundle? You know, you <laughs> end yeah. up in there. Are you going to end up in there eventually, you think? Or how does it... How long would people have I to wait if they wanted to wait for the Steam sale? Yeah, I think everybody does it a little, little different. But uh, I think a bundle is something you maybe do at a little later stage. I think, folks, it's worth the eight ninety nine. So, <laughs> go to Steam, buy it, enjoy. 
I play it on a variety of controllers. <laughs> play, it, play it with your kid if you got one. <laughs> uh, We're even thinking about doing, you know, kind of a also tribute to the old and golden days, uh, kind of a boxed edition with a kind of a physical copy and maybe even kind of a maybe a printed map or a manual of some sort. Oh, that'd be that'd be cool. You could put it out on tape. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I wonder if anybody. I wonder how many people watching this would have a way still have their old. Uh, cassette was the uh, the cassette recorder thing for their commodore 64 where they can play the, <laughs> the game off the tape <laughs> there's yeah. can't be there's probably a billion of the guys who watch this show would have that but uh and people have been asking us if we would uh, be interested in porting it to the c64 and amiga and, and do a version for those but uh, i think that m might be later in the pipeline but that would be really awesome you know yeah, you could use, well, I don't know if you could use a shoot 'em up construction kit to do that, but <laughs> I'm sure people must have uh, developed some pretty cool C64 tools by now, right, for making. You said you were using Game Maker for this? Yeah, it's the, it's the Game Maker, the first edition. I wonder yeah, if there's a plug-in or something for that that would let you put it out on a C64. There's not a direct plug-in, I think, but... Uh... There are some guys around that would probably do a really good job. And uh, the graphics actually, of course, nowadays you don't have the strict limits with color count and so on. But uh, I always think uh, in my back of my mind, I think, uh, OK, I could reproduce this with, you know, 32 colors on the Amiga, say, if I stretch it a bit. I really I, I remember sitting and thinking, well, do I really need to add this color or do I use the ones in the palette? <laughs> Because in the Amiga days, of course, you had the 30 color palette and maybe 16 for entire games. Yeah, somehow they still made beautiful games. It's, it's amazing. Well, anyway, Thomas, it's been good chatting with you. I hope your game does well. I'm going to post uh, the links to this. Uh, Thy Sword. Uh, maybe check out Vindicator 2, uh, their earlier game. Uh, these are, are they anywhere other than Steam? It's uh, it's Steam exclusive. Steam it's... exclusive. So <laughs> I know somebody's going to ask this if I don't ask you. So are you, you going to put it on GOG? Uh, we might we might do some talks with GOG. I think that would Thy Sword would fit right up there. Yeah, I think it would. Do they have have super meat? Always, Any place that I has Super there's... Meat Boy should have Thy Sword. There are some people I think that uh, prefer some stores over the other. So that's always a good thing to be on several. Yeah, for, I got a lot of good old games uh, fans that watch the show in there. <laughs> I gotta I'll mention. Wait, your, I'll wait for it to be on. God, okay. I gotta gotta mention on your channel there. Uh, I was so uh, excited when the Heroes of Might and Magic came up because I played that quite a bit when I got into PC gaming. And of course, I'm still trying to beat NetHack uh, all those years <laughs> in. So <laughs> keep trying. Yeah. Oh, what a great game! All right. Well, anyway. Uh, thanks again, Thomas, and I'll see you next game, I guess. When, when, when's it, when, is that, when is that going to be? <laughs> well, it may not make it to Christmas, but we'll get catch right up there. <laughs> All right, well, keep in touch. I salute you, Matt, and your viewers and your channel. It's been great. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I'll try to be back as soon as possible with a new uh, episode, but to be honest with you, I'm getting uh, really backed up. It's kind of crunch time here at the university. Uh, so I'll just have to say uh, I'll keep producing the episodes as, as uh, much as I can to try to get them out on a weekly schedule. But if you see a couple of weeks go by without a, an episode, don't, uh, <laughs> don't freak out. It's just me kind of behind in my uh, schoolwork. So uh, anyway, I'll try to keep them uh, coming. And I do want to mention I've got an interview coming up soon with Steve Ince of uh, Revolution. Uh, these are the guys that did Beneath the Still Sky, uh, the Broken Sword series, uh, was it Lure of the Temptress, uh, several other ones. Uh, really excited to have him on. He's really one of the big names in uh, graphical adventure games. Uh, so if you have questions uh, for Steve, uh, be sure to let me know here in the show notes, and I'll ask him uh, in a couple weeks when I do the interview. So. Uh, thank you for that, and of course, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much for your support of <laughs> Matt Chat. Uh, you're keeping these episodes in production, guys. It's really, I uh, just really, really appreciate your help with this. Uh, I only ask uh, for a buck a show. 
Uh, so if you want to ship in, just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site and set up an account. And I do have an update on the super secret, uh, <laughs> totally awesome uh, Matt Chat mystery prize. Uh, these are uh, physical items that I'll be sending to people that have accumulated over $100, $100 of support uh, for Matt Chat over the, uh, over the years. Um, there, everything is uh, in production now. It should be uh, arriving here soon. I'll start shipping uh, these things out. Uh, obviously, they're physical items, so I need to have your snail mail or a P.O. box or some way to, uh, to get these things to you. And it seems like it's a little bit confusing how to get this done, but uh, you go to the Patreon site, you find your Matt Chat information on there, and you can uh, fill in your uh, physical address there. Uh, so... Uh, it's a little tricky, but there are some comments on the uh, Patreon site to help you find your way there. Uh, but uh, I really do need those addresses soon because uh, you really wouldn't want to miss out on uh, one of these prizes. Uh, so I'll go do that uh, while you're thinking about it. And I think that will uh, <laughs> take care of that bit of the show. Uh, but anyway, what about that news for the match? Quite a bit of news today. Uh, we got Chuck Somerville, uh, just a guest, just had him on. Uh, he wrote in about this himself. This is a auction, eBay auction for an Atari Lynx. It's got two games, Chips Challenge, and uh, I believe uh, the other one is Summer Games. I didn't write that down, or California Games, I think. Uh, anyway, it's he's uh, going to sign these, autograph the system and the cartridges. And the cool part about this is he's not just doing this for his own. Uh, enrichment. Uh, instead, he, a uh, young single mother starting a new family, uh, gave it to him, I guess, just to be nice. I didn't even know this thing was uh, worth anything. Uh, but he's turned around and he's going to sell this uh, on eBay and basically and give her the money <laughs> uh, for her family. Uh, so it's up to $550 already. It's got uh, four days left to go. Uh, so go check that out. I think it'd be really, really cool to have a, an Atari Lynx and those two games all signed by uh, Chuck himself. I mean, that'd be a really great, unique uh, collectible. And plus, it's for a good cause. So uh, thank you, Chuck, for sending that in. Uh, and then Shane wrote in about this. This is uh, Fallen Gods by Wormwood Studios. This is in production now. It's an RPG inspired by the board game Barbarian Prince, uh, the computer game. Uh, King of Dragon Pass, the sagas, Eddas, and folklore of the far north. Uh, the core of the game will be around the choose-your-own-adventure vignettes in the style of the <laughs> Lone Wolf game books. And they're estimating this might come out later this year, but probably 2019, uh, maybe even later. It's kind of one of those, it'll be done when it's done uh, kind of deals. So uh, anyway, we'll try to stay on top of that Fallen Gods by Wormwood Studios. There's some uh, bad news. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, you might remember me uh, interviewing Stephen Kick uh, from Night Dive Studios. Had him on back in 2016 to talk about his uh, System Shock HD remake. Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, that project—it was a Kickstarter project. It's all kind of been put on hold. Apparently, they just got really uh, bad case of uh, mission creep or feature creep, whatever you want to call it, and they're having to just start over, I guess. Or uh, they said they've taken a, let me just read his uh, quotation here. Uh, we need time to reassess our path. We are taking a break, but not ending the project. A system shock is going to be completed and all of our promises uh, fulf uh, fulfilled. Uh, so they're still hoping to deliver this, but it sounds like it'll be maybe another couple of years before the game comes out. Uh, they've really been catching a lot of flack over that uh, announcement. So uh, I don't know, I hope uh, Steven is doing okay and that they'll still be able to get this uh, project <laughs> completed. Uh, don't get too uh, discouraged. All right, and then finally, uh, Archduke Griffith uh, wrote in about this. It's a new documentary called The Secrets of Blackmore, The True History of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, they've got a trailer for it. It looks, it looks really good. Um, uh, they said about half of it is about David Wesley, uh, who I had on this show. Uh, just last year. Uh, the, uh, the catch is, if you want to see this thing uh, when it comes out, you have to go to Gary Con. Uh, that's a con here in, uh, well, it's in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, uh, so not too far from here. And it's uh, from March 8th 
to 11. So apparently this is a really good uh, convention. It's about, it's in honor of uh, Gary Gygax. And <laughs> if you want to really meet some of the old school D&D crowd, some of the original crew, uh, you'd want to go to Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, and go to Gary Con. I think you have a lot of fun. All right, that'll do it for the news. Uh, so what about that ale of the week? Or ale of the two weeks, I guess. <laughs> uh, so this is a, a St. Bernardus ABT12. This is a Belgian Abbey ale. I thought I'd really give myself a treat <laughs> this time. Huge fan of uh, Belgian Abbey ales. Love them. Uh, uh, some of this is not in English, so <laughs> uh, let's see, 10% alcohol. Uh, so that's, you know, that's probably about normal for a Belgian ale, Belgian Abbey ale. Let's see, Brewery St. Bernardus was founded in 1946 in uh, what looks like Wattau. <laughs> for sure, I'm never, you know, it's impossible to pronounce these things just by looking at the spelling. Uh, the province of West Flanders in Belgium. Uh, so let's see. Give us any information. Uh, these traditional ales are matured in tanks for three months. <laughs> when it was, it's like a Sherman tank. Uh, before being bottled conditioned. Uh, the result is a naturally carbonated living ale. Uh, that will satisfy the taste of even the most discriminating connoisseurs. <laughs> ah, bringing heavenly nectar within reach. Classic quadruple style of Belgium's best Abbey health. <laughs> Serve this noble and wonderfully balanced brown ale at 52 to 56 degrees Fahrenheit in a goblet glass to best enjoy its delicate bouquet. Hmm. Uh, the delicate bouquet will get ruined in the <laughs> confines of my drinking horn, but so be it. Anyway, I don't really see anything else here about the ale, so uh, let's get this sucker open. And it does have one of these awesome corks. I love the beers with the corks because it gives me a chance to practice my marksmanship. <laughs> All right, can he do it this time? I don't even know why I do this because I might even damage this camera and then there would be no more match yet. <laughs> Yeah, we go. I had to shoot it with my phone. That wouldn't be too too good with it. All right, here we go. Come on, you know they should put sights on these things. All right, here we go. It's um almost out. There, it's, it's coming now. <laughs> oh, there, there we go. Ready? Oh, <laughs> I missed it by this much. Well, anyway, well, let me get this into the drinking horn and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this St. Barnardus ABT-12 Belgian Abiel quadruple style here in this rather excellent drinking horn. And I wish you guys could smell this. It's just, it's just such a wonderful aroma. It's very citrusy, almost like a, and like some orange zest. Uh, just a really, really good smell on this. No alcohol fumes and nothing unpleasant like that. Uh, just a real uh, nice citrusy, uh, citrusy aroma. Uh, so let's go ahead and give this a taste. You do have to be careful with these because the head, <laughs> uh, they can foam up really bad. You have to be really slow when you pour them and you don't want to shake it up too much <laughs> like, like I'm doing right now. Anyway, let's give this a taste. Oh, boom. Man, now that is what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, really delicious, uh, super smooth. Uh, the flavors on this are just really incredible. A really vibrant sort of a, uh, yeah, you do sort of taste a little bit of a citrusy taste as well, but it's almost kind of a, maybe a hint of the grapefruit in there. Uh, I, did, I really liked it. Let me try it again. Yeah, just a really uh, a nice taste on this good finish. A little bit of a, what is that flavor? Now, there's always uh, some little flavor to these things that just evades me. Uh, I'm not quite sure what else is going on there. I'll try it one more time, see if I can pinpoint that. Yeah, what, what is that? It's, it's kind of like a little bit of a, almost like a wine-like flavor there. 
And there's definitely some kind of grapefruit, grape-like uh, aftertaste with this. Uh, but anyway, it's just super, super delicious. I'm going to just try, uh, try it one more time. Mm. Yeah, it's just really, really good stuff. Nice, thick. Uh, what was it, 10% alcohol? I don't even taste alcohol in that. I uh, just taste, uh, you know, kind of like a really nice sort of fizzy, uh, citrusy, uh, grapefruity kind of a drink. Uh, I'm going to go definitely go full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, St. Bernardus, uh, ABT12. I, <laughs> you know, I kind of had my suspicions that this would, this would be really, really good. It's kind of hard to go wrong with a, uh, a Belgian ale from uh, Belgium. That's kind of the... <laughs> <laughs> the standard that uh, a lot of other breweries try to uh, live up to. Uh, but anyway, five out of five, if you uh, uh, see this in the store, especially if it's on sale or something, uh, you definitely want to pick it up. I know you will like it and not be disappointed. All right, so let's wrap it up with a quote. And I found a quotation that I just think really fits the bill uh, for the subject of this episode. And it's uh, by Ch Gilbert K. Chesterton. That name's familiar. I think he's, is he the guy that did uh, Father Brown? No, I didn't look that up. I'm just now uh, looking at the name. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Uh, I really like that show too. I think Father Brown would probably approve of the uh, St. Bernardus uh, ale back there. Uh, anyway, the quote uh, goes something like this. Art consists of limitation. The most beautiful part of every picture is the frame. So ponder on that and see you guys next time. Does it always smell like this? How does the wind ever get in here?